Well, this is my favorite time of the week that we get to gather together in the name of the Lord and praise him. It's God's people coming together from exile to this place where we celebrate who he is. We praise his name and we're, I'm just thankful for these guys who can lead us in that. And uh, it's good to be with you and good to see you. And we're seeing some new faces. The summer crowd has begun to trickle in. We got 72, 73 yesterday. So that's when you start to come to the UP because it's awesome in the UP. Uh, this is what we li- well, This is why we live here right now. Uh, it's not that winter thing. And so uh, I'm glad that you're here with us uh, today. Um, if you would, would you stand with me? And one more time, I know we just sat you down and uh, it's not a Lutheran church. Don't get, don't get confused. Um, we're not going to have you stand up, sit down type of thing, but we're going to read this together. This is the Apostles Creed. If you would read with me, I believe in God, the father almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we are thankful for what you've done for us. We're thankful that you uh, came to earth and you, you chose to go to a cross for us. We're thankful that we can come together gathered in your name and we can praise your name. We ask that we would do that well as we open your word together today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, creeds are an interesting thing, and they're always connected, um, usually to something that's going on in the church. And so the Apostles' Creed wasn't actually written by the Apostles. It was written afterwards, and it was written for people who were in, they were going to be baptized. And you would, you would memorize the Apostles' Creed because it's kind of the 12 things that the Apostles continue to teach. And so when we read this, this is an ancient creed, and it was for the church, it was for the gathered to come together to have this common faith, to understand what they, they, they were putting their faith and their belief in. What I find interesting about it, though, is that you have a guy in there that is nothing to do really with the church. He's actually a, a Roman citizen, and his name is Pilate. And you go, well, why do they put Pilate in there? You ever ask that question? You ever read that before and go, well, like they could have put a lot of different people in there. You have, you know, Mother Mary, she makes it in there, right? She makes it into there. Jesus' mom, Mary, makes it in. And you go, that makes sense. They taught about her and her being um, like this this chosen by God. And God put a a baby in her through the work of the Holy Spirit in, in this virgin and really, want, like, you kind of get that. But Pilate, like, why him? Like, you could have put a lot of different people in there. Like, you could say something like, betrayed by, uh, by Judas, or denied by Peter, or punked by Calpheus, right? Like, you could put lots of different things in there. Why did they choose this? Like, why did they choose Pilate? We're going to talk a little bit about Pilate today. And uh, just so you know where we're going in the next few days... For a few weeks. Next week, we will be in chapter 16 of Mark. We've been walking through this for about 20 weeks, and we've been walking through the book of, of Mark and, and really looking at this new origin that we have because of what Jesus did for us. And so Aaron Green is going to close this series down. He's going to talk about the resurrection in, in, in 16, and it's going to be awesome. So be here next week for that. And then we're going to start a new series. And we're going to start this new series called Some Are, and not Summer, Some Are, and Some Are Family, Some Are Friends. And uh, we're going to, to begin that series, and we're going to walk through. There's two parts to it, and that's going to take us through the summer. So that way you know what we're doing. But we're going to look at this uh, passage of Scripture. We're going to look at what 
Pilate was all about, and we're going to talk a little bit about him and why we got to this place and how we got to this place where Jesus is going to go to the cross. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 15. If you don't have them, it'll be on my screen to my left and my right, and you can follow along as we look at God's word together. It says this, And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answers to, to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answers, so Pilate was amazed. Now, at the feast, he used to release, this is Pilate, um, used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was uh, was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as they usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him, that's Jesus, up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So, Let's talk just a little bit about Pilate. Who is he? Well, he's a third-rate Roman politician. And he is really elevated in church history to this, this place of prominence. But how did he get there? Well, the, the reason I believe the early church fathers put this into that creed was because it actually cemented something. It cemented that there was, number one, there was an earthly rule. There was somebody that God had appointed, put in place for people to, for them to rule over the people. And that is Pilate. And so he becomes the judge and the jury in, in this story. The other part of it is, is that it cements that this actually happened in history. Pilate was a real person. And it's not just like a story in the Bible. There are accounts of Pilate all through history in his reign in Jerusalem. And so how Pilate got there was this. Pilate was appointed by the Roman government to monitor the conquered land of Palestine. And so he was put there. Rome put them put him there and he said they said hey take care of this land make sure there's no insurrections care for it do your job and then you'll move on see palestine was not actually a good place to be a ruler it was kind of the lowest level that you would have you're the low man on the totem pole and, and so Pilate, he was actually there for about 11 years. We know this from historical documents. He was there for about 11 years. And you go, well, that, that's pretty good. He's the longest reigning, um, uh, longest reigning precept in, in that, that land. And you go, well, he must have been doing a good job. Um, no, he wasn't doing a good job. That, the, he, he was there in this low level, worst place you could go, usually you went there, it was a stepping stone to somewhere else. And part of the reason no one wanted to go there because it was a hot mess. The Palestine, the Jerusalem area, really hard to to reign over. Because why? Because Rome kept pushing in and saying, you know, that Caesar is king. Caesar is king. 
And the Jews are like, no, 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 that's not how this works. God is king, and he appoints our king, and you're not him. You're a Gentile. You're outside of what God has for us. And so there's always this tension. Pilate didn't help matters much. He would taunt the Jewish people. And one of the ways that he would taunt them, he, he brought this bust of Caesar into the temple. Well, this just ticked people off. They were angry about this. They were, the Jewish people were like, this is sacrilegious. You shouldn't do this. So there's this tension between the Jewish people and between Pilate. Pilate had to, to squash often these insurrections. Insurrections weren't, weren't new in Israel. And he would do it. He would do it harshly. At one point, to try to gain some favor with Rome, he helped to create aqueducts that went into Jerusalem. Pretty awesome, right? You have, now you have running water in Jerusalem. You can get, you have this water source. Here was the problem. How he figured out how to pay for this was he went and he robbed the temple's treasury. Well, you can see now why there's tension between these people. There's tension between Pilate and the Jewish people. And one of the things that we know also about him is that he, he was really mean, um, really difficult to, to live under. And he was, he was brutal. He was cruel. And we see, we see the people, the Jewish people bringing Jesus before him because they know something about him. They know that he's brutal. They know that he's cruel. And they want to get rid of Jesus. And so what we're going to talk about today is there, there are, in all four gospels, we see this basic discussion happening. And if you look at each one of them, they have a little bit different components to them, but often they will be exactly the same. And the first thing that is asked by Pilate to Jesus, is he really a king? And that's front and center of the discussion. Is he really a king? The second thing in the discussion um, was G- Jesus' guilt. Was he guilty of what they were saying, what the Jewish people were saying about him, what the the Sanhedrin was saying about him? Was he guilty or was he innocent? The third thing is this discussion that's recorded by the Apostle John about Jesus' understanding of why he came to earth. And he's going to tell us his mission and his understanding of why he's here. And then the fourth thing is this question of uh, of whether or not um, he deserves to die and whether or not there, he's going to be pardoned. And that's in all of the Gospels. You'll see a component of that. We're going to pick up in verse 1 and 2. It says, Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made, made their plans. So they, they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. And there's this question. Are you the king of the Jews? Asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. Any statement in the Roman government, in the Roman Empire, regarding someone being a king other than Caesar would, would be a, an affront against Rome. It would, be, it would provoke kind of a, a political backlash in the midst of this. We remember this when Jesus was born. Remember the, the three wise men, they're cruising through and they, they meet up with Herod. And what is Herod? He has invoked this thing because he hears that there's a king that has been born of the Jews. And so what does he do? He says, I'm going to kill all of these young boys. And so he's looking for Jesus and he tells the three wise men, he says, hey, tell me if you find him because I want to worship him too. He was lying. He was trying to kill Jesus. And so they have to escape. And so we see this happening all the way back from the birth of Jesus until now. Another thing that I think is interesting about this is because the Jews, Jerusalem, has been taken over and is a part of Rome now, Rome is actually the law. 
the Jews are not the law. And so all of, like, they're still practicing things, they're still doing stuff, but when it comes to the law of the land, it's Rome who is, who is, are the ones who are taking and, and, and are able to, to bring justice in that. In that first verse, what we see is Jesus is brought before the authorities of the Jewish nation. That's the Sanhedrin. They hold this consultation and they they bound Jesus. If you recall, when we look at the narrative of Jesus' arrest, remember he's in the garden, they come for him, and they're, they're there with clubs and spears and swords, and Jesus, he asks us, he asks a question. He says, do you think I'm a criminal or a robber? And Jesus willingly, he willingly goes with them quietly. There's no need at this point. There was no need then. There's no need at this point to tie Jesus up. Why are they doing this? Why did they tie Jesus up? Why did they bring him in this way? The reason that they bring him in this way it is, it's all about shame. It's all about mockery. They're mocking Jesus. They're shaming Jesus. They don't like Jesus. Jesus has caused a stir. People, remember, just a week, this is the last week. Remember the Gospel of Mark, in, in those last chapters, it shifts and it goes to from, you know, his whole life and it goes and it moves to this really focused moment in time of, of, of that last week of his life. And we know that he has been, he's been um, called Hosanna at the beginning of it. We know that he, he, has, he went into the temple and he got all rowdy and started throwing tables and stuff. We know that he was teaching in the temple. We know that he said, hey, these, these walls, not one of them, not one of these blocks are going to stand on the other block. We know all of these things that Jesus was doing and it was agitating. We know that he was there at the treasury watching put, people put their offering in it. And, you know, they're putting big wads of cash in the, in the temple offering. And Jesus goes, yeah, that lady who gave two bits. She gave more than everyone else. We know that some of the things that he said and some of the things that he did agitated these people because the people of Jerusalem are looking at him and they know that he's a part of the lineage of King David. They believe, some of them believe at least, that he's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the one they should truly follow. And these Sanhedrin don't believe this. They ask these questions that are are not real questions. They're accusational questions to try to trip him up. Well, they can't trip him up And so they're envious of him. And so they're trying to shame him. They're trying to mock him at this point. They're doing everything in their power to humiliate Jesus, to get people to start to look at them as the authority. So they go and they bring him outside and they bring him and deliver him to Pilate. And, and this is actually really cool. And I know this is a big history lesson, but this is important to, to the text. This is really cool. So Pilate lived in Herod the Great's palace in Jerusalem. And the Sanhedrin wouldn't even enter the halls of it because they thought Rome is, it is, it is disgusting. And if we walk into these halls, we ourselves will be defiled. And so they, so get this picture in your mind. They're bringing Jesus over to this palace that they're not going to actually enter in. Well, where are they talking to Pilate at? They're talking to Pilate in something called the pavement. And it was this was the courtyard outside. And so they're in this courtyard outside, and this whole discussion is happening in this courtyard. And Pilate would go there early in the morning, and he would sit on a seat called the bima. The Bema seat was a seat of judgment. And so you can see Pilate sitting on this seat. The pavement's all there. The people are there. They're trying to mock. They're trying to shame Jesus. But they're bringing him to be judged by a Gentile. 
This is an Old Testament prophecy that is being filled in this moment. That, that the Jewish people were going to take their, their Messiah, their anointed one, and they're going to bring him to the Gentiles in order for him to be judged. And so this is what we see in this picture as, as they're beginning to, um, beginning to, to bring Jesus into this, this place. The other thing that's really interesting in the midst of this. So remember, they're bringing him to him. They're bringing him out of, they're bringing him out of their jurisdiction into this other jurisdiction. They're bringing him out into this outer darkness, this place that they believe is horrible. It's defiled. All of those things that they, they believe about this palace. Well, in the Old Testament, there's something that they would do on, on a yearly basis. And they would take, this is just some symbolism, so stick with me here. They would take something called a scapegoat. And they would, they would put the sins, all of the sins of the nation on this goat, and they would lead him out into the wilderness. They would lead him out into the wilderness, and he would be in this utter darkness. And he would he would die out there, right? And he would be a sacrifice. And so can you see the picture here of what's going on? They're leading the scapegoat, who is Jesus, to what they believe is the outer darkness. It fulfills the Old Testament prophecy, but it also has this deep, rich symbolism that's happening in the midst of this. And what it's symbolizing is they're handing this over to Pilate, which symbolizes that the presence of God is no longer there. The presence of God is no longer there. But remember who Jesus is. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He is God. The presence, wherever he goes, there he is, which is God. And so in that moment, they're actually leading God out into this place that they believe is outer darkness. But the hope of the world is right there in the midst of this. There's some crazy symbolism that's happening in these 15, 15 little verses. So they take the living lamb of God. He was sent out of the Jewish law court and given over to the hands of the Gentiles, uh, represented by Pilate. And Pilate asks that question. Um, Pilate asks, is it true? Are you the king of the Jews? And, and Mark is so short in his words. He's so short in his words. In the other gospels, it expounds on this a little bit more, but Mark is like kind of to the point, like here's the stuff you need to know, let's get her done, right? And, and so you see the Jesus' reply, and it's very simple. His, his reply is very simple. He says, you say that it is so. And, and I think that translation is a little bit awkward because we think in our minds, um, in, in English, that would mean like, ah, you said it. Um, maybe that's true. Um, you're kind of doing, you're kind of speaking that. You may say that, but I don't. But that's not what Jesus was saying in the midst of that. What he was actually saying is, what you say, Pilate, is the truth. Yes, I am the king. And, and we can read this and we know this from other accounts. We know this uh, from the other accounts because Jesus, uh, he qualified that statement. And, and he said this, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my subjects would rise up right now and free me from the mob. But that's not the kind of king I am. And in other words, what Jesus is saying, you have nothing to fear. You, don't, you have nothing to fear from me in terms of political power of Rome my kingdom is not of this world. It, it, it transcends this world is what he's saying in the midst of this. And now he could have went on and, and he could have said, my kingdom, Pilate, is higher than your kingdom. My kingdom is the ultimate kingdom. And, and I'm the Lord of Lords. I'm the King of Kings. And, and he could have said all of that, but he doesn't. But he does acknowledge that he is the king. And, and so... um. According to John, when Jesus answered Pilate, he says this, Are you the king of the Jews? 
And Jesus, he actually switches the conversation in John. And I think we have it up there. And then he said to Pilate, so are you the king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come to the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And this is just an interesting discussion um, that Jesus is having. He, he gives the reason for his kingship in this. He gives the reason for his mission. He gives the reason why he came to the world. There's other places in the gospel where it changes that, or it doesn't change that, but it leads to that. Like in John 10, 10, it, it's, it tells us that Jesus' mission, that he had he come to give life and give it to the full and in Mark's gospel, he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so it's pointing to this. He's pointing to the truth that we're in trouble, number one, that we're sinners in need of a savior. And that savior is going to be Jesus. He's it's pointing to that, but it's a little bit different answer. In that answer, he says, I came to bear witness to the truth. The history of the Old Testament prophets, if you read these guys, they had the worst job in the world. Um, you ever watch Dirty Jobs? Anybody ever watch that show? I love that show. Like, it's so good, right? And he's in there, and he's like going into sewer systems and cleaning them out and going into the most gross places that you could ever imagine. The prophet's job was way worse than that. Way worse than that. Because what would happen was that, that the people had moved away from the truth and they had these false prophets teaching things that were not true and the prophet would have to come in and he would then bear witness to the truth. When this happens, when this was happening, um, it, it was the people did not like this. They were often, they were often, um, hostile to, toward them. And they, they would, they would push against whatever they were saying. And, and so in the midst of this, it was said that the truth was slain in the streets. So when the Old Testament prophets were speaking the truth, it was said that the truth was slain in the streets. Well, who's coming to be slain? It's Jesus who embodies truth, who is the truth. He's coming, and what's going to happen to him? He's going to be slain in the streets. When Pilate was before Jesus and said, uh, I came to bear witness to the truth, Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? This is part of the hard, hard part of it. I wish we had like a YouTube video of how this actually went. Because you can't really see like kind of the, the his face. You can't see if this was like sarcasm. You don't know the tone really. Um, you know, you can know some things about Pilate. It probably was or maybe was that. But maybe it was something else. Maybe in this moment the truth was standing before him. And he got a glimpse of the truth. The reality of what was standing in front of him. And he went, whoa. Like what is truth? Like I, this, is, this is embodied right here in front of me. We don't know that. We don't know that, um, but he asked that question. And we know this. We know that the next thing that he is talking about is that he gives this verdict. Remember, he's on the Bema seat. You can kind of see him sitting there. And he comes out and he gives this verdict about Jesus because they said, hey, he's claiming to be, he, he's claiming to be the king here. And, and if you don't, Take care of him. You're no friend of Rome. And we're going to basically tell on you if you don't take care of Jesus. That's what they're doing in the midst of this. And, and he, But Pilate comes out and, and he gives this verdict. The truth was standing in front of him. And he gives this verdict. He says, I find no fault 
in this man. This is Luke chapter 23. Matthew, uh, Matthew's account tells of Pilate's wife. She has this really disturbing dream, and after Pilate made his pronouncement uh, of the innocence of Jesus, he, he washes his hands publicly and says, I'm not having anything to do with this. I think because the truth was standing in front of him, he had a glimpse of it. He had a glimpse of the light of Jesus. And he went, I want nothing to do with this. And so he washes his hands of this. I find no fault in him. You want me to crucify him, but why? What evil has he done? That's in Matthew chapter 27. And in that moment, I think Pilate is actually speaking truth. When he comes out and he says, hey, I find no fault. Behold, the man, the man who's standing in front of me, I have nothing. Well, why can't he find any fault with Jesus? He's the perfect lamb of God without blemish. There's no fault to be found. You can can go in all of his closets. There's no skeletons. He was absolutely sinless. And and for that moment, Pilate spoke truth. There is no fault in him. He's the perfect lamb of God, the one without blemish. So why are these people, after this, this truth discussion, after this kingdom discussion, after Pilate, he pronounces him innocent. Um, why are, are they still, still going, I, I want him to be crucified. And so we get into this next section, which is the pardon section. And, and we know pardon in America. Um, and and we're very much aware of it these days. Um, we have talk about presidential pardon. And, and so there's this tradition that they have that they're going to let one prisoner go. And so we're going to pick up in Mark 15, verse 6. Now at the feast, he used to release from them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. Pilate had a tradition during Passover festival. He, he's going to release one. He's going to pardon one. And, and that prisoner would be made completely free. They were able to walk. Remember, he has Barabbas there, who is in an insurrection coming up against Rome. He's, he's trying to overthrow Rome, which is really kind of what the people wanted. And he murders somebody. He murders somebody. But what's interesting is verse 10, Pilate was aware of their envy. He saw the dynamics of what was going on. He knew what was happening. He read their, their minds and their hearts in that moment of these Jewish leaders. Let's continue on. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. He says here, they they only brought this man here because they were jealous of him. But I can't see anything that he's done wrong. I know this is, and this is, he's kind of smart here. He's like, I'm going to get out of this. I've seen the truth. I've stood before the truth. And and I I believe there's something here. I don't want to. I wash my hands of this whole thing. But how am I going to do this? How am I going to satisfy the crowd? Remember, he's a politician at heart. How am I going to satisfy the crowd? Well, I know. I'll give him this guy who has literally killed somebody named Barabbas. 
And I'll say, hey, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me, it's like the worst of the worst. I'll bring him and I'll bring this guy who's done nothing. Who do you want? Who do you want in public? They're going to, of course they're going to choose Jesus. I think this is what Pilate is, his mind is spinning. I think that's what he's thinking in this moment. And what do they say? No. We want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. There's some symbolism here. There's some things here that that uh, you can look and you can see. We'll do a little trivia here. Um, Barabbas is actually his last name. Does anybody know what Barabbas' his first name was? Anybody know? Jesus. Jesus Barabbas. Jesus Barabbas. So Bar means son. So Bar Abbas. Son of the Father. Son of the Father. That's what his name means. Jesus, son of the Father. Jesus' name was Jesus uh, Bar Joseph. Jesus, son of Joseph. And we know this. Bar means son. So we have Abba. He says you, you and I are allowed to call, call him Abba Father, right? We're allowed to call God Abba Father. We have this relationship with him. This is, this is Barabbas. Jesus Barabbas. Son of that. Well, who's, who, who is he the son of? Well, what the, what the scripture tells us is that you and I and Barabbas, we are sons and daughters of Adam, the first Adam. That's what the scriptures tell us. You and I have been born in, and we have a sinful nature. Well, how did we get that sinful nature? From birth, you have a sinful nature. That's what you're born into. Why are you born into that? Because you're a son or daughter of Adam, Adam and Eve. We all came from there. And so what this is saying is, is that Barabbas, he, he's, he's Jesus Barabbas. He's son of Adam. But the one who can save us is actually the son. He's the true son of the father. The one who can save us. He's the second Adam. He's the second Adam. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And, and so we have this really, really cool, like it was almost like God knew what he was doing when he put this stuff down, right? Like it, it's like too good um, of a story to not go, whoa, like there has to be a creator God who's in control of all of this stuff. And, and so you have Barabbas and you have Jesus. And they get to vote. And what do they vote? They vote. Let's free Let's free Barabbas. And what do we do with the king of the Jews? Let's crucify him. Let's crucify him. The crowd responded, give us Barabbas, kill Jesus. So Pilate, verse 15, wanting to, to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he scourged him to be crucified after he had beaten Jesus, after he had mocked him, after he had shamed the very one pronounced that he pronounced innocent, he gave him to the crowd. Uh, he gave Barabbas to the crowd and took Jesus to be crucified. He releases Barabbas. It's kind of stunning when you read it and when you kind of know that little bit of, uh, of words that are being used there. But the release of Barabbas is this wonderful, wonderful picture, an image of God's plan of salvation for us. The guilty are set free. The innocent one is put to death. But the guilty one is set free. Barabbas is spared. Christ is crucified. Here's the deal. You and I are all Sons of Barabbas. 
We're all in the same boat as Barabbas. We're guilty. We deserve the cross. We deserved punishment. But Jesus went to the cross for you and I, just like he did for Barabbas instead of Barabbas. They cried, crucify him. And the reality is, is we cried, crucify him too. It's through our life. It's through our sin. When we say no to God, when we, we've moved away from who he is, we've said no to him. This incredible analogy of the way that God pardons and justifies us who are ungodly. He frees us. He takes our punishment. The righteous for the unrighteous. We deserve punishment. But there's this incredible substitute who had to to suffer for us. His name is Jesus. We deserve death and hell. But the real son of God sacrificed himself for us. We are all by nature like Barabbas. We're guilty, wicked, and deserve to be condemned. But But when we were without hope, Christ, the sinless one, the innocent one, the one they could find no fault in, died for us so that we could move from sons and daughters of Barabbas to sons and daughters of the Father, sons and daughters of the Most High. When, when you say yes to Jesus, what happens is you are, you're entered into the family of God. You're washed with the blood of Jesus that was shed for your sins and my sins for the redemption of sin. Uh, the hand washing of Pilate's um, was not sufficient. We don't want to wash our hands of this thing. We want to enter into this thing that we were, we were, we were dead in our trespasses, but now we're made alive through what Jesus did for us on the cross. They sent him to the cross, an innocent man, the perfect lamb of God for you and for me, that we may have pardon, that you and I may have pardon. You were once a Barabbas. And now you've been reborn. You've been reborn as a son or daughter of the Most High. Let's pray together. Father, we come. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for what He's done for us on the cross. We're thankful for this really intricate story that happened in real life, in the real world, in real time. We're thankful that you did what you said you were going to do. That the Jewish people handed Jesus over to a Gentile and then he was crucified. We're not happy that he had to be crucified, but we're thankful that he was crucified. We're thankful that we were once sons of Adam, the first Adam, and now we're sons and daughters of the second Adam. We are, are, are connected to you. Our relationship has been restored. We've been pardoned from our sins because of what Jesus did for us, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful that we can put our trust in him. His blood is sufficient to cover our sins. It's in his name we pray. Amen.